California is one of America's most important naval bases and home of a huge aircraft industry. Here is built the Convair, one of the most revolutionary of all world passenger aircraft. This is not a Convair, but a U.S. Army troop carrier to carry 400 troops on 8,000 mile flights. By the plane. The Australian crews arrived to take delivery of the first of five Convairs. A modern passenger aircraft with pressurized cabins, two engines which have jet augmentation, and crews at 300 miles an hour. Chief Technical Officer John L. Watkins hands over a check for the first to General Lee Miller. It's a goodbye for Australia, and the crew are happy as they get ready for takeoff. For the very latest method of boarding a plane, this hydraulic loading ramp in the after section is hard to beat. And when everyone is safely inside, it folds into the fuselage. No real landing gear keeps the plane on an even keel on the ground. And as for maneuverability on the airfield, well, this is really something. John Forrest, Australia's first convair, takes off on its 18,000-mile journey. This is the world's longest ferry flight, from San Diego, north to Chicago and into Canada. Greenland and Iceland and on to England. Then south to Rome, Basra, Calcutta, Singapore, Darwin and Melbourne. Over 25 countries. Round the world in 10 minutes, we'll have to hurry. It's 1,300 miles to Tulsa Airfield where we refuel. Then it's nearly 600 miles to Chicago, which we're now approaching. And they're important figures because critics said the convair was useless over long distances. John L. Watkins checks fuel consumption and engine performance. He staked his faith in the convair, and it's proving him right. We're over Canada now, heading north. That's Montreal below, Canada's commercial centre. Then on to Labrador and Goose Bay, refueling early for dawn takeoff. Captains Chapman and Fisher have an 800-mile overwater hop ahead, and only one treacherous airfield which could be fogged in. Atlantic is spattered with icebergs. Navigator Bill Kerr is right on course, and there are Greenland's icy mountains. Clear sunshine reveals the beauty of a giant glacier. Three quarters of Greenland is covered with 10,000 feet of ice, and its mountains rear three miles into the Arctic sky. Flight engineers Windover and McLeod are happy as the convair comes down at Nassauwak. We're in Danish territory now, and the jet exhaust augmenters attract Danish airmen. But it's a short stop, and the convair roars down the fjord on another ocean hop, flying into bad weather on the 750-mile leg to Iceland. Fog is closing in, but radio engineer Alan Morton sends and receives constant information. Ice land below, and the convair wings swiftly to its landing at Keflavik airfield. It looks like Iceland from above, and it feels like it on the ground. The Atlantic crossing is never a joyride, but the longest hop lies ahead. 1,200 miles and England. Below is the countryside, green and friendly and the Empire's capital itself sprawling on both sides of the Thames. We've come 6,100 miles at an average of more than 200 miles an hour. Australian High Commissioner Beasley greets the crew, and he and his family have a close-up inspection of the new airliner. But the crew want to inspect London, so they ask a policeman, and the body, courteous as ever, doesn't let them down. Taxi, Governor! Well, it's a little older and slower than a convair, but much more effective in London traffic. So let's start sightseeing with the Houses of Parliament, still standing despite the blitz. And Big Ben, atop the 320-foot car that has become a symbol, a national monument. 
Their scarf still remain near Ludgate Hill, but rising above the rubble, St. Paul's Cathedral stands dignified and solemn. Another landmark seemingly untouchable. Nelson's Monument in Trafalgar Square and the inevitable photographer. Eros has been restored to his pre-war pride of place in gay Piccadilly. But for our last glimpse of London, let's go back to the Embankment and the Thames. To the sightseer, the character of London lies in the majestic Tower Bridge. But now England and the cliffs of Dover lie behind. There's France. An almost unbelievable patchwork quilt of well-ordered fields from 10,000 feet. With a tailwind flying at more than 300 miles an hour, we're over Geneva, home of the ill-fated League of Nations. And there's Mont Blanc in the Swiss Alps. No wonder it's called the White Mountain. Heading south, with another 900 miles in the log, approaching the eternal city, Rome. It's a big place, isn't it? No wonder it wasn't built in a day. The Colosseum, scene of the martyrdom of early Christians. Begun in 72 AD, the giant building took eight years to build. Mussolini had the Colosseum cleaned and preserved. And talking of Mussolini, here's his favorite balcony, scene of many a fiery speech. Our next stop is the island of Cyprus. We fly over Greece, mountainous and rugged. Civil war rages down there. The warm Mediterranean washes the shores of Turkey. It's 1,200 miles from Rome to Cyprus, but the conveyor takes it in its stride. Cypriots are a racial mixture of Turkish, Egyptian, and Greek. The men watch the conveyor and the women work. Water-worn pebbles are being used to lay down a new airstrip. No, they're not getting ready for a royal visit. Into the war areas again, and the danger of being shot down as we skirt Palestine and head for Basra in Iraq. Then on over Persia to the capital of the new Muslim state of Pakistan, Karachi. Pakistan was born amid strife and bloodshed, but it's peaceful now, and attractive. Karachi lies behind, below are the plains of northern India and the Ganges. Aviation writer Stanley Budgen and Sinisan cameraman Jeffrey Thompson record this record-breaking ferry flight. We're approaching Calcutta now, a vast city with a population of more than two million. Calcutta Airport, and of course there's the usual quota of overseers. India is seeking more Australian trade. They're careful to study us and Australia would do well to study them. Refreshments a la Mexicana with American propeller expert Tom Wilson, a charming and efficient hostess. We're flying towards Burma, a one-year-old republic, towards Rangoon, the capital, a city of temples, some like this one plated with gold. The convoy heads directly for Singapore, 1,200 miles away, eating up the distance in not much more over four hours. Singapore itself, its war scars covered, is going about its daily business on post-war models of the original bicycle built for two. Tropical clouds deck the sky above Borneo, the Dutch Celebes and the Kassa, and soon we're coming down at Darwin. Melvin Island Aborigines employed as labourers at Darwin RWF Station stage a native welcome to Australia. They know their aircraft better than most people and take a professional interest. The Convair's flown 16,000 miles in less than 72 hours. It wasn't out to break speed records. Due south now across the heart of Australia towards Alice Springs. We've crossed water, ice, snow, jungle, and now the red center. It's time to shave and get spruced up because we're on the last stage of a long trip. There's Melbourne, the end of an 18,000-mile flight. A welcome sight after a great trip. Australia's first convair, John Forrest, comes down at Essendon after a successful delivery flight. Critics said it was a waste of money, unsuited to Australian distances. But this flight has proved the critics wrong. 
on their through 1,300 miles non-stop on one hop across sea and land. And it still had plenty of fuel in the tank. Air Minister Drakeford and Airlines Commission Chairman Cole have every reason to be pleased. It's been a tough test, but the results are well worthwhile. The Convair, a bright new star in Australian passenger aviation. That's when I was assigned to cover Berlin again. Although the war was only three years ago and the city was still occupied and cut up like a pie, it had lifted its head and begun to walk. Berliners could find jobs, but they had to build places to live and, like the rest of the world, suffered shortages and post-war troubles. But the people lived in comparative peace. The ceaseless effort of the Office of Military Government U.S. was showing results. I was impressed with factories manufacturing for peace. Subways taking people to work. And trolleys taking them home. Places of amusement had crowds. Hospitals had milk for new babies. There was even music in the park. Everyone forgot or took for granted freight, electricity, roads, fiddles. Until June 1948, when suddenly the train stopped. For technical difficulties, traffic between Berlin and the western zones was banned. Canceled timetables, dead trains, walls of words and orders blockaded the city. The blockade even cut electric power and put out 75% of the light. People used candles if they could find them. Movement in and out of the city stopped. Factories now manufactured hunger and fear. Vegetables were planted in the parks and trading was more brisk in the alleys. Berlin no longer had prize fights or milk. In addition to two and a half million Germans, the same blockade affected 5,000 Frenchmen, 10,000 Englishmen, and 10,000 Americans. This crisis was met. The same morning the train stopped, they woke me up, early. I had to fly a special run from Rhine, Maine to Berlin with high priority military stuff. Nobody said that me and my old C-47 were starting Operation Fiddle. <laughs> I'd have shaved. Back in 45, western cities were connected with Berlin by corridors in the air. Sufficiently wide and high for normal traffic, they gave Berlin easy access to the western zone. But my one C-47 couldn't feed all Berlin a city bigger than Philadelphia. European Air Transport Service had initials which strangely matched the occasion. E-A-T-S. Since General Clay, U.S. military governor of Germany, didn't have enough planes to haul the supplies piling up outside the starving metropolis, he asked for help. This could have been any city, anywhere. But notorious German weather tried to interrupt the rescue. Although record rains fell that first month, General LeMay's coal and feed company increased fiddle tonnage with every flight. We flew in weather. I couldn't see my own fans turn over. But the 24-hour all-weather flying in crowded corridors was terrific training. Some of my buddies who bombed Berlin a short time ago were risking their lives again, this time to keep the same city alive. Bad visibility caused crashes. Fortunately, all four crew members were able to walk away from this one and fly more vittles. 
and the coal they carried was used in Berlin. The airlift continued even as Berlin's mayor led the German assemblies in paying respect to American flyers who helped feed the city. But with all this, the city was eating into its reserves. In the operations were British Sunderland, which brought four-ton cargoes to Berlin Lake. Their barges helped us over the blockade. Adding the Royal Air Force Station at Potsburg to the list gave the British Yorks, Lancasters, and our own C-54s another vital terminal only 50 flying minutes from Berlin. German kids often thanked Group Captain Yard in his RAF, as well as General LeMay's flyboys. We worked together in peace as in war. The Air Force planned the Berlin Airlift, and the President approved. Then Headquarters Air Force directed MAP, Military Air Transport Service, to put into effect the full Berlin Airlift plan. The spectacular Air Force Navy transport operation was shown to Air Force leaders the Secretary of the Air Force, Symington, and Air Force Chief of Staff, General Vandenberg. General Tunner, commander of the Airlift Task Force, briefed the visitors. Yep, they looked us over. The C-54 Skymasters from the Pacific, from the Caribbean, from the United States, and Alaska. At far-flung bases, Air Force crews had been alerted. C-54s can't move without us throttle jockeys, we flew the sturdy troop carriers, each able to lift 10 tons of coal and food in peacetime, as carefully as it carried 55 wounded men in wartime. We reported promptly, and our country was proud of its Air Force on a mission of mercy and international significance. Some of us came to Frankfurt in the American zone, to the Air Force base called Rhine Main. You know, those trucks were waiting for us. The Transportation Corps did a colossal job. We got down in a hurry to give them a lift. Rhine Main looked like a certain Pacific beach during the war. Only this stuff was much more organized. Somehow it all went into our airplane. The biggest item was coal for the utilities. It was packed in GI barracks bags. The second biggest item was made into pumpernickel, shelf strangle, and cooking. We call it bread. Then, medicine. Every ounce of cargo was checked. Of course, there was GI soap for the GIs, and milk for the innocent sufferers of every disaster, the kids. Rigid inspection paid dividends, kept maximum number of ships on the job, saved men and equipment, Train ground units. Streamlined maintenance for the lift was set up in Germany, England, and in Texas, USA. And from all the Gulf and East Coast ports, the U.S. Navy's sea lift, the ocean-borne leg of the Berlin airlift, brought approximately 12 million gallons of aviation fuel to Germany every month. We carried enough gas for the trip to Tempelhof and return. One of our gang, Lieutenant Halverson, loved the small fry. He instituted little fiddles. It wasn't much, just candy bars on tiny handkerchief parachutes dropped to the Berlin kids. A great guy. We all gave little fiddles candy and handkerchiefs. Good flying, chum. Like the rest of us, the tower gave Halverson a piece of sky. Clever stacking gave breathing room. Each plane got an altitude and a moving block of space. Forty to fifty airplanes were crowded in the narrow air bridge. Careful timing, controlled by the most modern communications facilities, made the airlift work. Yeah, that's how we could fly three round trips a day and supply food and fuel to a city of two and a half million with a handful of planes and even supply the kids who waited on a certain hill for a little bit. But big fiddles rolled on Templehoff's curving flight apron around the clock, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Even when the weather stocks in, 
we sell through the old man's plot system with beacons, ranges, and DCA, ground controlled approach, of the airways and air communication service. Without them, German weather would have stopped the entire operation. This Joe found us in the soup and quickly turned us over to another Joe who watched our plane on his radar scanning scope and actually talked us down out of the black sky. Our planes were like tight, tied with string, and GCA pulled us in. In good weather, we even made both a landing and a takeoff at the same time in less than three minutes. With long lines of trucks ready at Tempelhof for the quick arriving plane, unloading with volunteer DP crews reached new peaks of efficiency. Unloading made a pretty picture, but it was a rugged job lugging 100 pound sacks of coal eight hours a day. Some of the flour sacks weighed 200 pounds. 25 airlift trips by the C-74 Globemaster hauling bulky construction equipment and flour were made by this Air Force giant. Able to haul a cargo in excess of 20 tons, it brought blockaded Berlin enough flour in a single trip to feed 60,000 inhabitants a daily ration of bread. From the beginning, we began to smash our own records. No one in the world can eat tonnage figures. The cheers came at the end of the summer when, in spite of the blockade, Operation Vittles allowed the Berliners an increase in rations. The airlift payoff was in the bread people could take home. When this tragic story came out, a hospital in Denver, Colorado contributed the medicine. Life-saving streptomycin was flown to Frankfurt. The airlift took the precious package to the children's hospital, where doctors immediately put the miracle drug to work. To the kids in Berlin, Operation Fiddles was a game. Big Vittles was no game. To some it was labor. Tools came via C-82 flying boxcars from America. The famous workhorse of the airborne troops was specially designed for easy air cargo transport. Its tremendous capacity and truck high floor brought to Berlin heavy construction equipment, which made it possible to stretch old runways and build new ones. People everywhere watched the airlift task force. We flew 34 million miles, more than a thousand times around the Earth, into Berlin via the north and south corridors and out through the center. Our cargoes kept the city alive and dramatically illustrated the vast potential of air power. It is to do a job like this that America needs a peacetime air force in being. By 1949, we carried in almost three quarters of a million tons. Operation Vittles was an operation for peace. In addition to feeding a city and flying reserve supplies, America showed that men and machines of war-developed air power can and do serve humanitarian purposes in days of peace. This is Berlin. It could have been Detroit, Springfield, Pasadena, or your hometown. This is your Air Force in action. Air power is truly peace power.